so Dr. Mary, Dr. Mary Jane Rubenstein is a professor of religion and science in society at Wesleyan University and is affiliated with the philosophy department and the feminist gender and sexuality studies program there. She holds a BA from Williams College, an MPhil from Cambridge University, and a PhD from Columbia University. Her research unearths the philosophies and histories of religion and science, especially in relation to cosmology, ecology, and space travel. She is the author of Astrotopia, The Dangerous Religion of the Corporate Space Race, which you'll be hearing, I think, some material from that book, more or less, this afternoon. Uh, that book just came out from University of Chicago in 2022, um, and I highly recommend it. I think it's one of the the first works of yours that seems to me to make the, a more explicit connection between um, thinking about space, cosmology, astronomy, and actually, I would say ethics, but at least the environment in a, in a much more explicit way. Pantheologies, <clears throat> excuse me, um, God's Worlds and Monsters, Columbia University Press 2018. Worlds Without End, The Lives, Many Lives of the Universe, I'm sorry, The Multiverse, which is the book that uh, just received the IRIS Award just this afternoon, if you missed that, well, congratulations. And uh, Strange Wonder, The Closure of Metaphysics and the Opening of Awe, Columbia University Press, 2009, which for me was a book that I came across when I also became very interested in wonder and started writing about wonder. And then I came across, I think, first an article of yours and then your book, and I thought, she already said like everything that I wanted to say, which keeps happening, which keeps happening with everything that I am interested in. I think, ah, well, Rubenstein already did it. So. She's also, um, and of course, she just won the uh, 2022 Iris Award for her book um, that I mentioned earlier from 2014, Worlds Without End, The Many Lives of the Multiverse. So. And she's also involved currently in a project called uh, Sacred Space, Religion, and Cosmic Exploration, which is a series, or involves a series of webinars with Lance Garabi, um, and this is through the Interplanetary Initiative here at Arizona State University. So please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Mary Jane Rubenstein, and we'll have some time for questions and comments afterwards, but we will have to also clear out of this room quickly to prepare for our evening festivities. So welcome, Dr. Rubenstein. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you to Lisa and to Amanda Nichols and to Evan Berry for getting together this just beautiful gathering of lovely people. Um, I have never been to the ISSRNC. Um, this is my first time here, and I am just taken by the collegiality and warmth and generosity of everybody here. So I'm so grateful for the, um, the community here and for the welcome that you've given me. Um, thank you all so much. Um, quick zero item, <clears throat> Jacob Boss and I seem to be wearing the same dress. Um, our, our slides are, uh, have the same background, um, because what else, but so anyway, um, great slides look alike. I'm sorry, Jacob, that I, that, you know, I hope that that's okay with you. Um, okay, I'm going to start with a tune-up. <clears throat> I'd like to open by considering the title of our joint endeavor this weekend, After Earth. Each of us could endlessly turn this little stone of a prepositional phrase and reveal in it all manner of meanings. But to me, there are three that most readily announce themselves. The first is the sense of after Earth as straightforwardly temporal. There has been Earth, and there either will or won't be something after it. So I'll be talking today about plans to move some portion of humanity and human productions off this planet and onto another. Plans that will allegedly allow the species to embark on an eternal cosmic future. These are instances of after Earth in its most ploddingly sequential sense. It's the kind of thinking we find in the post-apocalyptic Will and Jaden Smith film that shares a title with our conference or in Interstellar with its somber, destinal tagline, mankind was born on Earth, it was never meant to die here. The second sense of after Earth, as it resounds in my particular ears, is ontological, taking its lead from Bill McKibben's suggestion that what we are living on and as is no longer Earth. 
rather than a self-regulating, broadly homeostatic, Gaianic symbiont, the planet has become a convulsing set of mutually destabilizing systems that McKibben calls Earth, as if the planet itself were groaning and wailing at us. And third, you knew I'd do this, you can't be a continental dweeb and not do this. Third is the sense of being in pursuit of Earth. And it's this sense I'd ultimately like to consider as a possible horizon. Here's some Hildegard to help us. What if we thought of Earth as what we're after, as what we want, what we desire, what we're trying for? Thackeray uses the preposition in this sense when he speaks of an abiding tenderness in the newcomer's most worthy titular colonel. With that fidelity, which was an instinct of his nature, writes Thackeray, the brave young man thought ever of his absent child and longed after him. What if Earth were what we long after, what we care about, as in, she asked after the health of my mother? What if it's not speed or comfort or even love that we're after, but Earth itself? In the human condition, Hannah Arendt reminds us that the word human is etymologically inextricable from humus. To be human is to be earthly, earthish, earthen. In this particular sense, then, it's actually incoherent to speak of humans living in space. Once we figure out how to build communities elsewhere, we will be post-human, post-humus, or rendered more optimistically by my colleague Lance Garavi, astro sapien. If we ever actually move to the moon or Mars, we will, along this interpretation, be a different species. We will no longer be human. And in fact, Elena Rochi uh, argued earlier this afternoon that we're already no longer human. We're already something else. Then again, to cite Eleanor Craig's riff on Sylvia Winter, we have, in an important sense, never been human. After all, the imperial culture that has defined humanity in its own image has been so ruthlessly inhumane that the concept collapses under its own colonial freight. Then again again, as Winter herself insists, the dehumanized have always invented new ways of being human that transform the terms of that term, in particular by refusing humanity's frenetic self-distinction from the animal, vegetable, mineral world, along with the frenetic Abrahamic distinction between this world and divinity. In this sense, we might think of being after the human and being after Earth as entangled projects, and here I'm indebted to Carol Wayne White, for whom becoming human would also mean becoming more than human, which is to say both earthen and sacred, and as such totally bound up with the more than human world that constitutes us and that we in turn both create and destroy. All of these senses of after Earth can be found uncannily composted in the funeral litany of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, whose familiar ashes to ashes, dust to dust is preceded by the phrase Earth to Earth, a rare Orthodox admission that the Earth is our Alpha and Omega. We come both from it and to it, which is to say we're both after it and after it. This afternoon, evening, I'll be focusing on the first temporal, arguably least interesting sense I have just sketched of after Earth, in the hopes of opening onto the last aspirational sense of it. I'll spend most of my time unveiling the new workings of what Amber Lowe theorized yesterday as the master's clock, that is, the unrelenting teleology of settler colonialism that's now urging us to go grab new land and exploit after Earth. It's a shocking instance, I'll use this term again, of what Alfred North Whitehead called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, namely the notion that living after Earth means abandoning it by boarding rocket ships and building new homes in underground Martian bunkers and orbital space colonies. Especially for the theatrically inclined, it's a fascinating story. Honestly, if I were feeling more playful, I'd suggest we turn the whole thing into a comedy of errors, call it the fallacy of misplaced concrete, and run it in a Gilbert and Sullivan theater. The problem is, I can't find this particular story funny for too long. 
Because regardless of whether Elon Musk ever makes it to Mars, or Jeff Bezos actually builds a paradise between the moon and New York City, they and their astropreneurial cohort can do a monstrous amount of ecological damage to and beyond the Earth in the meantime. The key then will be to expose the temporal fallacy of the messianic edge of new space and to turn the sequential otherworldly after Earth into a passionate this worldly one. And let me apologize um, for Sarah uh, McFarland Taylor's and my uh, spending this much energy on Elon Musk today. Um, as you will see, our papers start from very similar places, uh, diverge along totally different sources. Um, Sarah's sources are just stunning, and thank you so much for them, and arrive at the same conclusion. Um, so this only means to me that we must be right. Um, so thank you again, Sarah, for your beautiful, meticulous, and fun paper this morning. Part one. On October 23rd, 2020, one day after the final presidential debate and seven months into an epidemiological nightmare that had closed schools, crippled local businesses, killed hundreds of thousands of Americans, and made most parents into psychopaths, the GOP tweeted a final distillation of its campaign platform. Prez Trump is fighting for you, it exclaimed. Here are some of his priorities for a second term. First, establish permanent manned presence on the moon. Second, send the first manned mission to Mars. After the moon and Mars came infrastructure and Wi-Fi. And then, in a follow-up tweet, the GOP promised a COVID vaccine, medical supplies, and pharmaceuticals. But they clearly wanted the moon and Mars out front. Who wants to worry about respirators when you can dream about rockets? You might recall that during his first 100 days in office, President Biden signed 60 executive orders, almost half of which were direct reversals of Trump-era policies. This administration disagrees with that one on almost everything except outer space. In fact, the only major Trump-era objectives the Biden administration has retained are, first, the creation of a space force to wage orbital warfare, and second, the plan to settle the moon and Mars through a new mission they're calling Artemis, after the Greek goddess of the moon, the twin sister of Apollo. Why do we need to settle the moon and Mars? In Biden's non-referential words, because America can do big things. We can see possibilities no one has seen before. We can go places no one has ever gone before. The message was frankly clearer in the Trump administration, which insisted that it is America's duty to spread its influence throughout the universe. As Trump declared in his last State of the Union address, in reaffirming our heritage as a free nation, we must remember that America has always been a frontier nation. Now we must embrace the next frontier, America's manifest destiny in the stars. Most of us are numb at this point to the extension of frontier language into space, but like any dead metaphor, this one conceals far more than it reveals. We're all indebted to Catherine Newell for having tracked the metaphor of space, the final frontier, to the 1952 special issue of Collier's magazine entitled, Man Will Conquer Space Soon. The lead article, written by former Nazi rocket scientist Werner von Braun, was called Crossing the Last Frontier. In the short years following his amnesty through the CIA's then-secret Operation Paperclip, von Braun had become convinced it was America's destiny to extend human civilization into outer space for the sake of freedom, democracy, and get this, eternal salvation. A little-known detail that Catherine reveals about von Braun is that during his denazification on American soil, he became a born-again Christian who believed it was incumbent upon American earthlings to spread the gospel to what he called man's oldest and last frontier, the heavens themselves. Space travel, as von Braun saw it, and as Trump recently reaffirmed, is a vertical extension of manifest destiny. Just as God allegedly endorsed and even demanded the westward expansion of mainly white-skinned European-descended Americans in the 19th century, God is calling Americans in the 20th and 21st centuries to conquer a new frontier, an infinite frontier, in outer space. Okay. 
So in February of 2020, Trump says, we're going back to the moon and then to Mars because space is the next frontier and America's manifest destiny is in the stars. Of course, the language of divinely authorized conquest is nothing new in the American space program. The only thing that's unprecedented in this contemporary space race is the extent to which private industry is involved in this godly conquest. And for this development, we must thank not Donald Trump, but his ordinarily more palatable predecessor, Barack Obama. The key date here is February 1st, 2010, when the Obama administration released the 2011 budget for NASA that ended the space shuttle program and reallocated funds to the so-called new space industries. It's time, Obama's advisors had written, to con consider turning this transport service over to the commercial sector. You know, to make rocket ships as mass produced as cars and buses and speedboats and airplanes. The problem, of course, was funding. Who would invest in a company dedicated to flying supplies up to the International Space Station? What would be in it for the shareholders? The situation for the cosmic prospector seemed grim until November of 2015, when Congress passed a startlingly bipartisan bill called the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, which promises, among other things, that any US citizen who recovers a rock or mineral or quantum of water in space is allowed to own, use, and sell it. Huzzah, said the investors. We're saved, said the space mining firms that seemed to spring out of a thousand simultaneous nowheres. After all, if a corporation is a person, a citizen even in US law, then its hypothetical extractions and uses and sales will be protected under this law. Elated, the CEO of Moon Express, a lunar mining outfit that collaborates closely with NASA, went so far as to call the CSLCA the aeronautic equivalent of the Homestead Act. Space. Finally, another frontier for restless white folks. This economically giddy corporate proliferation has brought us into the era known as new space to an already dense field of political, military, technological, and religious reasons to get America back to space as soon as possible, New Space adds the speed and intensity of unregulated capitalist economics. And the excitement over this new gold rush in space transcends party lines. Unable to agree on literally anything else, our elected officials on the left, center, right, and alt-right snuggle in together to hand outer space over to these cosmic conquistadors, these ast astropreneurs, whom I've come to think of as particularly toxic techno messiahs. And so Sarah was sketching the three roles of the saint and the messiah and the, help me, the what? Yes, thank you. And I'm going down the, mess the messianic route right here. To be sure, the astropreneurs don't seem particularly religious. They lack the rousing scriptural appeals of Mike Pence, who assured us that God was calling America to conquer the heavens. They can't even muster the civil religiousness of Trump's manifest destiny or Biden's vague spirit of America. What they offer instead are promises to make life fun again, to cleanse us of the guilt of fossil fuels, and above all, to save humanity from eternal death. How will they accomplish such lofty goals? by converting the cosmos itself into capital and building a new Jerusalem on the infinite frontier of outer space. The world is coming to an end, the Messiah cries, but trust in me and I'll bring you to a new world where you'll finally be free. Free from death, free from earth, free from guilt and gravity, at least most of it, and free above all from earthly regulation. In the meantime, China's got a rover on Mars, a satellite on the far side of the moon, and a brand new space station in low Earth orbit. Richard Branson is selling $200,000 tourist, dollar tourist tickets on his notoriously unreliable space plane. Space mining firms have collected billions of dollars before they've even got their probes on an asteroid. A failed Israeli mission has dumped dehydrated tardigrades on the lunar surface. Rwanda has bought the rights to launch 300,000 satellites of its own. The U.S. has created a new branch of the military to pulverize its enemies from the heavens
begins and some astronautic startup says it's going to build a Ferris wheel shaped space hotel in orbit and name it after, wait for it, Werner von Braun. How did we get here? What is going on? And is there anything, any, who, do you want to stay at the von Braun space hotel? Like that is the last place. Is there anything anyone can do about it? I first realized something was up when Elon Musk launched a car into orbit. It was January of 2018 and SpaceX was looking to test its Falcon Heavy rocket, woo the US military, and make sure everybody was watching. So rather than display the rocket's carrying capacity with, say, slabs of concrete or steel, Musk decided to strap a blazing red Tesla Roadster to its back. You will recognize this slide from Sarah's presentation. A perfectly good, even exquisite car. $100,000 worth of chrome, leather, steel, glass, state-of-the-art navigation software, green technology, and human labor hurled uselessly into orbit, not around the Earth, but around the sun. It was an act of immense bravado, extraordinary waste, and literally cosmic presumptuousness. Now, along with eight planets and some dwarves, moons, and asteroids, there is a tricked out convertible circling our solar orb, driven till the end of days by a mannequin in a spacesuit called Starman. Musk named his Sisyphean astrobot after the alien messiah of David Bowie's 1972 Ziggy Stardust album. Bowie's song, Life on Mars, accompanied the rocket launch that flung the roadster toward the stars, and his space oddity still loops endlessly on the car's solar-powered JVC speakers. Starman's glove compartment is stuffed with multimedia versions of Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Isaac Asimov's Foundation Trilogy. And the Falcon Heavy rocket itself is named after the Millennium Falcon of Star Wars. Musk, you might say, is a geek's geek. His aesthetic composed by a nostalgia for the future of his teenage past, complete with rockets, spacesuits, Martian colonies, glam rock, and a free market promise of infinite possibility. Musk is also an inveterate showman. Back in 2003, he was having a hard time getting NASA to take SpaceX and its newly fabricated Falcon 1 seriously. So he drove the seven-story rocket on an enormous flatbed truck from Boca Chica, Texas to Washington, D.C. and parked it on the street outside the headquarters of the Federal Aviation Administration. In the two decades since then, Musk has continued to manufacture all manner of mind-blowing spectacles, Twitter storm launches, dramatic explosions, tickets sold to billionaires for trips on unbuilt ships, and a manifesto about his intention to save humanity by getting the hell off this doomed planet Earth. Meanwhile, on the other side of Texas, Jeff Bezos has been making a lot less noise. In the early 2000s, while Musk was dragging NASA, the Air Force, Boeing, and Lockheed Martin into high-profile antitrust suits, Bezos was quietly buying up ranches. Under the auspices of improvised corporations, Bezos cobbled together over 300,000 acres of West Texan land so he could test his rockets without anybody noticing. Musk had bought the land too, but he makes so much noise that the rangers at Mother Neff State Park now warn their visitors that if something sounds like the end of the world, it's probably not, at least not yet. The men are both magicians, but of really different sorts. Musk pulls rabbits out of hats while Bezos makes the coin disappear behind your ear. While Musk is shouting, look, mom, wait, that's not it. Wait, let me try. Bezos hides in his room to perfect the trick. Both billionaires are building reusable, affordable, state-of-the-art rockets, but Musk raced to the launches while Bezos worked on the landings. Elon's had us looking up at the exploding skies, while Jeff has kept us staring at our own damn laps, one-clicking the lint rollers and cake pans and dog sweaters that finance his more cosmic endeavors. As Bezos finally explained a couple of years ago, quote, Every time you buy shoes on Amazon, you're helping Blue Origin. I appreciate it very much. And suddenly I hate my shoes. <laughs> Bezos himself articulated the methodological distinction between Blue Origin and SpaceX in a 2004 letter to his then tiny aerospace staff. Be the tortoise, he told them, and not the hare. His motto for the company is gradatum ferociter, or step-by-step 
ferociously, a gritter, grittier, Latinate rendition of slow and steady wins the race. The phrase is inscribed on banners beneath the company's coat of arms. It's got a coat of arms, which features two turtles standing on top of a globe, reaching from North America to a gilded solar system. Crowning the image is a cruciform sun. Anchoring it is a winged hourglass with all the sands run out. And the whole thing looks kind of like a 15th century cosmograph walked into a Harry Potter fanzine. <laughs> More nerd than geek, Bezos reads everything in print, considers even the most outlandish alternatives before making up his mind, and demands that ideas be pitched to him in full paragraph form. As we all know, he's a books guy. In addition to Aesop, his references include J.R.R. Tolkien, Isaac Asimov, Jules Verne, Ian e M. Banks, Neil Stevenson, and William Gibson. Now and then, he even mentions A Wrinkle in Time, the only work by a woman to make the astropreneurial canon. But when it comes to space, Bezos' biggest influence is Star Trek. While Musk is off actualizing George Lucas with his exploding falcons and epic soundtracks, Bezos is cultivating the more genteel gestalt of the starship Enterprise. As the Atlantic's Franklin Foyer reports, Bezos initially wanted to call Amazon makeitso.com as an homage to Captain Jean-Luc Picard, whom he now uncannily resembles. <laughs> Bezos named his dog Kamala in honor of the empathic metamorph you may remember from Creos Prime. And as you may have heard about a year ago, he boldly took William Shatner, where no 90-year-old actor had gone before. Um, Shatner came back terrified. Let's talk about that later. The question you might be asking is why? What are these billionaires up to in space? It is old news to you by now. Elon Musk wants us to go to Mars. In fact, he explained in a 2016 manifesto, it's been his goal all along, making humans a multi-planetary species by setting up a self-sustaining city on the red planet. To anyone who will listen, Musk explains that Earth is a ticking time bomb. Sooner or later, something will destroy humanity, whether it be an asteroid, nuclear war, or AI robots gone rogue. Sooner or later, we're going to have to find somewhere else to live, and given the literally infernal conditions of Venus, it's like 900 degrees Fahrenheit there, Mars is our best chance. Uh, Catherine explained this morning the roots of this logic, this coming disaster logic, are also in Werner von Braun. Of course, five billion years from now, the sun will explode into a red giant and engulf Earth and Mars in a fiery apocalypse. So if we want humanity endure, to endure forever, we're eventually gonna have to make it to another solar system. But we'll never be able to live anywhere else unless we start close to home, and soon before a giant asteroid or Alexa 5.0 wipes out the whole species. At times, Musk seems to realize how much he sounds like that guy on the street with a cardboard sign, portending the end of the world. Both disavowing and adopting the role of lunatic prophet, Musk writes, I do not have an immediate doomsday prophecy, but eventually there will be some doomsday event. With apocalypse on the horizon, our first option is to let, just let disaster extinguish us, as it did the dinosaurs. An option Musk finds so intolerable, he never even entertains it. The alternative, he says, is to become a space-bearing civilization and a multi-planetary species, which I hope you would agree is the right way to go. So Mars it is. The challenge will be making the enterprise affordable-ish. At the moment, Musk shows, by means of a perfectly bizarre Venn diagram, the price to Mars is infinite, leaving the set of people who want to go to Mars completely distinct from the set of people who can afford to go to Mars. Using conventional technology, Musk estimates that the price for a round-trip ticket to the red planet could drop from infinity to $10 billion a person. But once his rockets attain full reusability and efficiency, Musk predicts he'll be able to lower the cost to $200,000, the median cost of a house in the United States. At that price, in his words, almost anyone could go to Mars. All they need to do is save up a bit, sell their house, and pack a very small bag. 
Anyone who doesn't have a house to sell can always get sponsored by an employer and pay it off with a few years of labor as an indentured servant. I swear to the gods he has said this. <laughs> when it comes to advertising his new colony, Musk alternates between appealing to aspirational homesteaders and revving up post-adolescent pub crawlers. On the one hand, he admits, Mars is going to be seriously hard work. Under current conditions, it's impossible to breathe or even just be on the planet without a spacesuit. Since Mars has so little atmosphere, it would turn all the water in the human body to steam and kill it instantaneously. Even with a spacesuit, there's so much radiation on Mars that it will likely cause the colonists severe health problems. So as Musk concedes from time to time, Mars will be like the Oregon Trail on a really bad day. There's a good chance you'll die, he says. It's going to be tough going. On the other hand, and this is the part Musk tends to dwell on, the Martian Trail is going to be pretty cool. The trip itself will be like an astronautic club med. A hundred people aboard one 400-foot BFR, or big effing rocket, for a seven-month trip that Musk insists will never feel cramped or boring. There will be zero gravity games, Musk is really into bouncing around. Plus movies, lecture halls, cabins, and our restaurant. It will be really fun to go, Musk enthuses. You're going to have a great time. Nowhere in these descriptions does Musk explain who will be staffing the restaurants, cleaning the cabins, or wiping the space vomit off the gleaming walls of the BFR. Nor does he say who will be giving the lectures. Will it be you? Will it be me? Extolling the virtues of Sylvia Winter and Robin Wall Kimmerer on a six-month rocket to Mars? As for the planet itself, Musk promises that it would be quite fun to be on Mars because you would have gravity that's about 37% of that of Earth, so you would be able to lift heavy things and bound around. Sure, the air is primarily carbon dioxide, but the same stuff that's so toxic to humans will make it easy to grow plants, quote, just by compressing the atmosphere, unquote. Faced with the problem of what he calls the radiation thing, Musk says inexplicably that it's not too big of a deal. And although he understands that Mars is a little cold, the average temperature is negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is to say over 100 degrees below freezing, he assures his future colonists that we can warm it up. <laughs> How exactly do you warm up a frozen planet? You stick it in the microwave. Hit the airspace above the ice caps with some hydrogen bombs and you'll jumpstart the global warming process, liberate tons of water, and move the Martian colony that much closer to autonomy. To be sure, most scientists think this is an absolutely ridiculous plan. The director of the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, has estimated it would take more than 10,000 missiles to carry out the nuke Mars plan. 10,000 Musk's response on Twitter, no problem. <laughs> if you're furrowing your brow at this pla fantasy of planetary hacking, you're not alone. As astrobiologist Lucianne Walkowitz reminds us, we don't have a great track record of controlling geological processes on the planet we've already got. How can we hope to make a habitat out of Mars when we can't even preserve the habitability of Earth? It would seem that recalibrating the biosystems of an already oxygenated, temperate, blue-green orb would be a far easier task than bringing a planetary dust storm to life. When, asking, when asked why he is choosing to save humanity by sending us to Mars rather than by addressing injustice, poverty, and climate change on Earth, Musk will often laugh and say, please forgive the direct quotation, fuck Earth, Earth is done, Earth is history, Earth is so last eon. Considering the coral reefs, wetlands, and clean skies that SpaceX has polluted and destroyed, and considering Musk's own advancement of artificial intelligence, one could even accuse him of worsening the disaster to intensify the need for salvation, of making the planet genuinely uninhabitable so that we will indeed need to leave it for an after-Earth Martian utopia. Unlike the more classic utopians, Plato, Moore, Marx, and Engels, Musk doesn't give us a clear idea of what his ideal society looks like. 
What he offers instead are abstract promises of freedom from earth, from international regulation, from gravity, and even from death, at least at the level of the species. He hasn't hammered out the details because the details would destroy the perfection, but it's going to be awesome on Mars. Part four. Jeff Bezos isn't so sure. To my friends who want to move to Mars one day, Bezos reports, I say, why don't you go live in Antarctica first for three years and then see what you think? Because Antarctica is a garden paradise compared to Mars. We have sent probes to every planet in the solar system, says Bezos, and believe me, Earth is the best one. There are waterfalls and beaches and palm trees and fantastic cities and restaurants, and you're not going to get that anywhere but Earth for a really, really long time. So if Musk is happy to leave Earth in the dust, Bezos is set on saving it. If Musk named his SpaceX after the place he'd like to go, Bezos named Blue Origin after the place he'll always be from this gem of a planet called Earth. How then will Bezos restore and preserve the blueness of our origin, the beauty of our Earth, by getting us off the planet? The problem for Bezos is energy. We're using too much of it. Given an expanding and modernizing human population, global industrial humanity will reach some absolute limits within the next century. There's simply not enough fuel whether from the ground, the wind, or even the sun as it's accessible on Earth, to power a whole planet's worth of first-rate hospitals, bleeding-edge electronics, megachurches, superstores, slaughterhouses, and industrial farms. We need more energy, so we've got to go to space. So the old Marxist adage is true. It's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Rather than proposing an alternative to the extraction of resources, the relentless pursuit of profit, and the wasteful cruelty of factory farming, rather than use the funds he calls his Amazon winnings to win back the actual Amazon, Bezos is spending all that money and time exporting the whole ecocidal system into space. Here's the way it'll work. Rather than trekking out all the way to Mars, which is just too far, Bezos proposes we construct a series of bases on the moon. We install solar panels on every base, gaining access to far more solar energy than we could ever harness on Earth. We mine the moon for water, whose elements can be split and recombined into rocket fuel. Using far less energy than we need at Cape Canaveral, we power mini missions to mine asteroids for heavy and rare earth metals, at which point we begin to construct miles long, free floating habitations between the earth and the moon. Yes, you've heard that right, giant space pods. The idea comes from Gerard O'Neill the Princeton physicist who began proposing in the mid-19th century that all heavy industry and much of the human population be moved into space. Mines and factories would occupy asteroids and the moon, while residence, recreation, and commerce would take place in giant cylindrical tubes rotating to simulate gravity and positioned at Lagrange points to maintain a steady orbit. Having attended O'Neill's lectures in college, Bezos remains a devotee. This is Maui on its best day, all year long, he says. No rain, no storms, no earthquakes. In our climate-controlled Edens, we'd have everything we love on Earth, like air, tree, birds, and beaches, but nothing we hate. O'Neill infamously promised we'd finally be free of mosquitoes. And in the meantime, Mother Earth would get a long overdue nap. With all heavy industry and a good deal of humanity relocated off planet, the Earth could be zoned for light industry, some residence, and recreation. In short, Earth would become a planetary park, a great vacation spot, a lovely place to go to college. Meanwhile, out in space, humans would get to play as many video games, have as many kids, and eat as much red meat as they want, powered by limitless energy. According to Bezos' calculations, an O'Neill-hacked solar system could in principle support one trillion human beings. That's a thousand Mozarts, he marvels. A thousand Einsteins. What a cool civilization that would be. It seems a cheap but necessary shot to point out that by this dopey logic, we would also gain a thousand Hitlers and a thousand Stalins. But Bezos is leaving it to the next generation to work out the details. How are we going to build O'Neill colonies? Out of what materials? Under what sort of political systems? Bezos has no idea. He's here to build the infrastructure so that the big thinkers of the future can hammer out the details. 
In short, Bezos will establish the extraterrestrial roads and bridges so that the future dreamers can figure out what to do with them. Bezos will pay the way, pave the way for future Bezoses and Zuckerbergs and even future Musks once they've had enough of those radioactive dust storms on Mars. So these are our two post-terrestrial utopias, fuck Earth and occupy Mars versus save Earth by drilling the universe. Of course, both of these visions are a long way off. So far, no one's been to Mars, no one's mined an asteroid or built a rotating space cylinder, and it's been half a century since anybody walked on the moon. But in the meantime, the new space nicks are already making a total mess. Musk has filled his allotted altitude in low Earth orbit with so many Starlink satellites that he's edging into the territory allocated to Amazon. Astronomers and space ecologists keep warning that between dead satellites, live satellites, paint chips, lost tools, shrapnel, old cameras, and the International Space Station, there's just too much stuff up there. At speeds of 18,000 miles per hour, the collision of anything with anything else is disastrous, and despite our steady ability to produce this deadly litter, we have absolutely no way to clean it up. The most promising idea so far, which failed spectacularly the one time it was tested, is that we might be able to snag some passing garbage with a harpoon. <laughs> a, a harpoon. <laughs> it's like whaling technology. The scene in space is total chaos, and yet Bezos, Musk, and a growing cadre of smaller time astropreneurs continue unfazed, promising thousands more satellites, suborbital tourism, orbital tourism, private space stations, space hotels, and gazillion dollar asteroids, all as multifarious means to our beautiful future in space. The road to utopia is paved this time with careening space junk and towering egos, swearing till they're blue in the face that they're doing it for all humanity. Part five. There are six parts, by the way. You're like, how many damn parts are in there? There are six. Part five. It's a logic as familiar as Neil Armstrong's moonwalk. One small step for a man is supposed to have amounted to one giant leap for mankind. But the Apollo missions ended up doing very little for poor black indigenous and immigrant people in Armstrong's own country, not to mention the entirety of mankind. Similarly, the escalating pursuit of profit in space will leave non-investors even farther behind than they already are. As the New Republic's Clive Thompson predicts, the big winners in space will likely be the big winners on Earth. After all, a corporation's chief obligations are to its wealthy shareholders, not to its workers or even its clients, let alone the whole species. And yet the corporations keep feeding us these mystifying promises to benefit humanity, assuring us in the words of science writer Martin Robbins that when we go into space, we will all magically become nice. Under these conditions, though, it's just so unlikely. Do we really expect that the billionaires who can't find any cause worth supporting on Earth will finally redistribute their wealth once they get deeper into the final frontier? Do we really expect that the notoriously inhumane industries of mining, manufacturing, and global retail will suddenly establish decent working conditions on literally uninhabitable planets and asteroids? Where a person's employer controls her access not only to healthcare and food now, but to air? And what about all the ecological damage these companies are doing in the meantime on Earth? What happens to our environment when a single rocket scorches the land it leaves behind, drops its boosters in low Earth orbit or dumps them in the sea, and deposits millions of pounds of rocket fuel into the atmosphere? What happens to the residents of Boca Chica, Texas, whom SpaceX has displaced from their suddenly toxic homes, including the humans who now can't afford to live anywhere else because nobody wants to buy their houses, and the wildlife that has increasingly nowhere to go? In what sense is this space adventure benefiting all humanity? If these galactic messiahs kill off most of us in the process, along with the only biosphere that allows us actually to be, then what exactly are they saving? The operative fallacy here, to which Jacob introduced us yesterday, is known as long-termism. Popular among Silicon Valley types, the long-termer conviction is that the galactic immortality of the species is more important than the current well-being of any given community. 
Hunger, poverty, racism, warfare, hurricanes, floods, pandemics, genocides, and extinctions might seem like enormous concerns, but ultimately they're just the ups and downs of the evolution of the species. As techno-philosopher Nick Bostrom assures us, from the perspective of humanity as a whole, even the worst of these catastrophes are mere ripples on the great sea of life. So the key is to rise above the everyday struggles of particular humans and focus instead on the long-term existence of the species. I'll give away the punchline and say that in addition to being a dreadful reading of Hegel, long-termism is a high-tech version of what Malcolm X called pie in the sky and heaven in the hereafter. Sick of the suffering black Americans continued to undergo for the sake of an unjust law and order, Malcolm blamed America's racist social system on the Christian teaching that earthly suffering would be rewarded in the afterlife. To his mind, the doctrine of heaven maintained and even glorified oppression, convincing black Americans that it was useless or even ungodly to overthrow their oppressors. From the perspective of eternal bliss, poverty, racism, and even enslavement would seem like nothing at all, mere ripples on the great sea of life. Similarly, the space-hungry billionaires tell the poor, the refugees, the sick, imprisoned, endangered, and extinct to hold out for heaven on the asteroid belt. There is a murderous numerology at work here, which sets the 8 billion people currently on the planet, 700 million of whom live in extreme poverty, against, say, the 10 to the 23rd people who might exist if we managed someday to colonize the Virgo supercluster. You see, you see, 10 to the 23 is numerically more, a whole lot more than 8 billion or 700 million. Therefore, the long-termers insist that our energies be directed toward the hypothetical humans rather than the actual ones. In fact, they caution, actual humans might not actually be actual at all. They could be computer simulations. I'm not making it up. The idea, as you know, has been around in one form or another since Descartes meditations, but it came raging back in 1999 with the Matrix and in the gamer geek philosophy of Bostrom, who argues that if it is possible, even in principle, to create a conscious simulation, then we are almost certainly living in such a simulation. In the meantime, the futurist economist Robin Hansen reasons that if we are living in a simulation, we should behave as brashly and boldly as possible so that our simulators remain sufficiently entertained to keep us plugged in. Assuming that we are living in a simulation should have the overall effect, says Hansen, of making us more present-oriented and more selfish than we might otherwise be. Your motivation to save for retirement, he reasons, or to help the poor in Ethiopia, might be muted by realizing that in your simulation, you will never retire and there is no Ethiopia. I won't drive you mad with the details of these scenarios, which are mind-boggling at best and diabolical at worst. I bring them up only as a means of filling out the intellectual biography of our most energetic space utopian, whose deep dive into long-termism has produced in him a conviction that we are most likely living in a computer simulation. Our consciousness is probably the creation of super-intelligent beings running a super-advanced version of Minecraft, and the rest of the universe is just a virtual backdrop to our trivial pursuits. Or it's always possible that we're not so much simulated as manufactured. If it's not a simulation, Musk speculates, then maybe we're in a lab and there's some advanced alien civilization that's just watching how we develop out of curiosity, like mold in a petri dish. But whether we're mold spores or Mario and Luigi, the quest is clear, to stay alive by going forth, increasing and multiplying. And here's the thing, if the world around us is just a quantum computation, or an alien petri dish, then who cares about coral reefs and wetlands? If they're really important, the simulators will make more. And if they don't make more, then the herons and the frogs and sea turtles will have been a necessary trade-off to get humanity up to the next virtual level on Mars. It's at this point that the desperate among us might seek out those poets and prophets who can see through the absurdities of our current situation. Those poets and prophets who, rather than giving us some, the same world on another planet, can actually imagine other ways of being. Part six, and part the last. In The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas, science fiction author Ursula Le Guin describes a gleaming utopian city. 
The streets are bright and colorful. The parks are healthy and plentiful. The people marry the music gay, the animals well cared for, the sun and rain in perfect balance, and the technology sufficient to everyone's comfort within the bounds of mutual care. For example, there are very fast little trains, she says, and double-decked trams, but no cars or helicopters. The only hitch is that the joy of this city is sustained by the unrelenting suffering of a single child, naked, sporadically fed, and locked in a basement with old mops and dirt floors. They all know it is there, the narrator explains, all the people of Omelas. Some of them have come to see it, others are content merely to know it's there. They all know that it has to be there, that their friendships, the beauty of their city, the tenderness of their friendships, the health of their children, the wisdom of their scholars, the skill of their makers, even the abundance of their harvest and the kindly weathers of their skies depend wholly on this child's abominable misery. In a brief preface to the story, Le Guin traces its central conceit back to the American psychologist William James, who offered it as a thought experiment. What if millions of people could be kept permanently happy on the one simple condition that a certain lost soul on the far off edge of things should lead a life of lonely torment? James finds this prospect unbearable. None of us, he insists, would accept such a bargain. In fact, the very knowledge of the torment of that one soul would ruin the happiness of all of our millions, wouldn't it? Dear old William James, says Ursula Le Guin, so mild, so naively gentlemanly. Look how he says us, she marvels, assuming all his readers are as decent as himself. But of course we're not. What Le Guin's narration allows us to realize is not only that some people are happy to balance their happiness on the suffering of others, like the Omelans and their sacrificial child, but that most of us in the overdeveloped world are as well. Most of the wealthy residents of these overdeveloped nations are delighted to find bargain clothes made by children in basement sweatshops. Most of us are happy to travel to resort towns whose residents are denied access to their own beaches. Most of us love fresh fruit even though it's been grown and picked under unbearable conditions, flown on jets that pollute the airways, driven on trucks that kill whatever tries to cross the road, and carefully stacked by people who can't afford to buy it. This is the way capitalism works. The happiness of some is sustained by the suffering of everyone else. The only difference between us and the Omelans is that we don't really want to know any of this. And of course, that the suffering children on whom we rely are horrifically more numerous than one. Le Guin's story ends with a tribute to the ones who walk away. Those few Omelans who realize that their happiness is not worth the suffering of even one child and who walk alone into the darkness. The place they go towards is a place even less imaginable to most of us than the city of happiness, the narrator confesses. I cannot describe it at all. It's possible that it does not exist, but they seem to know where they're going, the ones who walk away from Omelas. And Le Guin's implied question is whether you, the reader, are able to see it too. Can you imagine a society that doesn't depend on the misery of others, a kingdom of God that's at hand rather than hovering in some cosmic hellscape? Can you see it clearly enough to believe it? And can you believe it enough to start walking there? Can you walk away from this hatred of the earth and its creatures? Can I? But where would we go, you might ask? Given the global and now outer spatial reach of corporate capital, there is no away left, at least not one to which any of us has physical access. Where could we possibly go to live otherwise? And even if we could find such an elsewhere, what about that poor, naked, suffering child? How would our walking away from Omelas do anything to change Omelas? Couldn't we be accused, like the rich guys, of blasting away from our world rather than caring enough to fix it? These are perhaps some of the questions Afrofuturist sci-fi author N.K. Jemisin had in mind when she wrote her narrative response to Le Guin entitled The Ones Who Stay and Fight. In the resplendent city of Amhelat, the people are well-fed, healthy, and even joyous. They hail from diverse backgrounds, speak multiple languages, and enact laws that ensure the safety and comfort of all citizens. And so this is Amhelat, the narrator explains, a city whose inhabitants simply care for one another. 
Throughout the story, the narrator pauses to address our likely skepticism. How could a society possibly be this functional, this communally minded, this joyous? Surely there's a hitch. Of course there's a hitch. And much like Le Guin's Omelas, the hitch of Jemison's Umhelat involves a child, a single child, whose father has discovered transmissions from the benighted hellscape of the reader's own world, our Earth and who has begun to learn from earthly media and to spread the idea, so commonplace here, that some people are less important than others. This poison threatens the society of Amhalat so fundamentally that a panel of reluctant social workers finds the child's father, kills him, and then turns to face his enraged, grieving, ideologically ruined daughter. And just as the reader braces for more violence, one of the social workers, quote, crouches and takes the child's hand. What, the narrator exclaims, what surprises you? Did you think this would end with the cold-eyed slaughter of a child? There are other options, and this is Amhalat Friend, where even a pitiful diseased child matters. There are other options, not somewhere out there, but in the middle of the mess we're in. Finding them and living them out would be the work of the ones who stay and fight. In other words, the ones who stay are actually the makers of other worlds. Meanwhile, the escape artists refuse to see that the world might be otherwise. It's the ones who stay who end up making other worlds, while the ones who blast away preserve the very world they're escaping by refusing to see other options. I point out this ironic alignment, not in order to raise objections to Le Guin, to whom I am desperately indebted, but to point out the deeply conservative nature of the Astrotopians. The rocket men want to leave the Earth because they want to keep the world the way it is. So they seek more land and resources to plunder in space. Meanwhile, the hungry, colonized, black, indigenous, working class, Earth-loving and peace-seeking among us are filled with what Afrofuturist jazz genius Sun Ra called the burning need for something else. Not the same system in some cosmic future, but a radically different system right now and right here. As the Americanist Jaina Brown writes in Black Utopias, we must jump into the break, the cut, into an entirely different paradigm. Le Guin herself issued a similar imperative when she received the 2014 National Book Foundation Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters. Hard times are coming, Le Guin said, two years before the election of Donald Trump when we'll be wanting the voices of writers who can see alternatives to how we live now. According to Le Guin, it is authors of speculative fiction, science fiction, and fantasy who can see through our fear-stricken society and its obsessive technologies to other ways of being and even imagine real grounds for hope. Other ways of being, as in Jemison's Umhalat, whose residents can all have homes if they want them. A city where every soul matters, a city whose inhabitants simply care for one another. It's that sort of world she imagines, and it's that sort of earth that I'm after. Thanks. Thank you. We have until 5.45 um, for some Q&A, so um, hold your hand up if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, and Amanda will bring you a mic. I once had a, um, while you're thinking, I, uh, Usually at the beginning of class, you know, to warm things up, I'll ask if the students have any announcements. Are there any things you want us to come support? Are you, you know, are you going to go hit bats and balls? Are you going to sing? Are you going to whatever? What can we come give announcements? And they, they, had, they had no announcements, and they looked totally miserable. So I knew I couldn't just start class. You know that look when you look out at your students, you're like, damn it, what am I going to do with these kids? Like, they're just, they're miserable today. And so I was like, does anybody want to dance? And one of my students, God bless Wesleyan University, was like, I'll dance. Like, really? <laughs> He's like, yeah, what you got? And I was like, I, 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 he asked me to put on uh, A Day in the Life by the Beatles. This, this baby who was born in like 2014. <laughs> I put on A Day in the Life and that kid stands up and just dances for five straight minutes. And then the song ends and he sits down and the class is like, yeah, 
like, what? Nobody got up to dance with the poor guy, but like they were all really into it. They were really into somebody else dancing. Okay. Hi. <laughs> That's another question. You gonna you gonna dance, Alexis? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm curious to the extent to which you think that it's uh, these these like Elon Musk and people who are, have these kind of plans to go to Mars and things. The extent to which they're trying to say themselves or what or they actually believe this or whether they're trying to get us to believe it right because the idea is that if if it's if, it, if there's something they're actually trying to do it seems like it's philanthropy right because it's some, something they're never going to be able to see because it's so off in the future even if they do do work um and so the question becomes is it just something like that we we will stop being concerned about about the way in which our planet is being destroyed and we're, we're all being harmed because we're because now we, we 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 trust Elon Musk will help us something like that in the end and he doesn't really believe that he can do this but yes. that he's trying to get it. so do you think that's what's going on or do, do you think that I mean it's hard to say with motivation yeah, sure, or sure. that there's that they actually legitimately or convince themselves that this is possible or what yeah. do you think is going on with their motivation okay so for what it's worth I think they're both um, earnest I think that I think they both believe what they say um, it may not be true it may be that they're you know like truly diabolical geniuses being like ah, I'm gonna say this but I'm really just gonna make a lot of money bah. like I think that they both think that this is the way to ensure the long-term survival of the human species all this having been said, I think that their visions are different and their motivations are different. And this question of selfishness versus selflessness is a little bit different. Um, Jeff Bezos talks about um, wanting, he says, you know, look, we could stop using so much energy, but that would be really boring. And I want my great, great grandchildren to be using more energy than I do. And the only way my great grandchildren can use more energy than me is if we go into outer space. So he's concerned for his lineage. He's not necessarily concerned for himself. I don't, he doesn't think he's going to survive this. But he's concerned for his lineage and for the kinds of people he, he wants there to be more guys like him. Him and Mark Zuckerberg. He, those, those, are, those are the big, you know, um, and, his, and his grandchildren, right? Um, and the way to do this is um, to ensure that they can have as much energy as they want to in outer space. Um, but he's, he's not going to get there. So in that sense, yeah, he's like, um, I don't know, he's like Vanderbilt and the railroads or something like that. Like he's building the infrastructure and he's like, go, be a great nation without me. Um, Musk is a little more complicated. Um, he's, he, think, he says he wants to die on Mars. Um, I don't know uh, if he really thinks he'll actually get to Mars. But whether or not he can, he's so taken by this Bostrom simulation argument that we need to get to Mars in order, again, to assure the long-term survival of the species, in order to keep us going long enough to figure out a way ourselves to simulate consciousness. Right? Whether we're already simulated or we're not already simulated, we need to figure out a way to do it ourselves, because once we can do it, then we can bring back Elon Musk after he's dead. Um, so he's obsessed with bringing back the great men of the past, and he wants to be one of those who can be just like downloaded into any piece of body um, in, the, in the Virgo supercluster or something like that. So there does seem to be a little more, but, but either way, I don't think we gain a lot by saying that they're not, um, they're not being honest with us or something. I think, I think that they are. And then the question is whether, or not, and just like, you know, we, th those of us who, again, teach religion, we, we teach about charismatic prophets all the time, and I think most of them are fully convinced in the truth of what they're saying. That doesn't mean it's a good religious movement, right? It doesn't mean you want to move to that particular commune, but yeah. Thank you. That was absolutely fabulous. Thanks. So I want to ask you a question about Peter Isherwell. He's the fictional uh, billionaire guru in the movie Don't Look Up. Are you oh, familiar? Damn it. I started watching it and then I oh, So uh, okay. I will ask the question in such a way that it, you do not need to have seen the film. Thank you. Right? The, the, <laughs> this figure in the film stands in as a sort of doppelganger for Musk or uh, uh, Bezos or to a lesser degree Steve Jobs right sort of obsessed with their own impact on the grand arc of human history mm -hmm. so in that movie it the the character shows up as sort of an obvious critique so maybe I'm a bit of a, a naive is this the one who's like is it bad to make a lot of money should we not be really rich well, is he's, that guy? that's one of the acolytes uh, who, he's an who's acolyte. persuaded okay. by okay. this character's uh, race to mine asteroids right Great. so okay. th the question is sort of like why don't we see through these in persons, right? Why don't we recognize Musk as a Barnum and Bailey circus <laughs> actor? Uh, and that's a, perhaps a naive question for a scholar of religion to ask, right? Why don't we 
see false prophets for what they are. Yeah. Uh, but really the question is, what kinds of counter narratives do you see? I think uh, citing Le Guin and uh, um, Jemison here at the end is a great way to do that. But I'd love to hear you sort of think out loud about sort of like what kinds of opposing narratives help uh, call into question the, the the kinds of, of power and influence that these individuals have. Thanks. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, okay, so why don't we see these false prophets for who they, well clearly some people do, like the folks who made Don't Look Up, because um, it's clear what the tone of the movie is, even though I you know, haven't seen the whole thing. Right. Um, and clearly some people don't, right? The folks Sarah was introducing us to who are like the, the hardcore Muscovites or Musketeers or Muscowitzes or whatever, right? They, they, um, they, are, they, they want this vision, they're excited by this vision. I think in part because space is really cool. Um, I open this, uh, this book, um, this Astrotopia book, by thinking about my own fascination with space, right? I'm, I'm in the middle of, you know, thinking about this critique of all of these these figures trying to colonize the cosmos, um, and and I look around my my five year old's bedroom and I realize that like all of his stuff has like little stars and cosmoi on them and little galaxies and I'm like oh wow I'm obsessed with space like what do I want from space right um, space is really cool the idea of you know living in a new society elsewhere is um, is 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 attractive, has been attractive since the doctrine of Terra Nullius that Whitney Bauman exposes so beautifully as the product of a particularly bad reading of Genesis, right? Um, so, I, you know, I, I understand why they're so excited. They're excited because, I mean, Musk says at some point, like, there has to be good news at some point. Like, we got we got to give kids something to believe in, people, like some, there has to be a future for them. And so this is a pro promise of a future, like you, you, you want a future um, if you're a person. And so that's, you know, that's possible and, 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 it's, and it's cool. Um, my own students, for what it's worth, when we study this material together, hate, first of all, they hate Jeff Bezos even more than they hate Elon Musk, which is really interesting to me. I have a little soft spot for Bezos because he's such a nerd, you know, like he's always citing things, got footnotes, things like that. But, um, they absolutely loathe Jeff Bezos. Um, they increasingly dislike Elon Musk since the Twitter business. Um, that notwithstanding, they, um, they dislike them, but they, think they, they can't see around the logic. They're like, yeah, I, I don't know. What else are we going to do? I guess I'm going to go live in an orbital space colony. There's, a, there's another Jemison um, short story in this uh, How Long Until Black Future month. Um, the same volume called Cloud Dragon Skies, and in this, it's it's every um, there's a there's a major apocalyptic event, and everybody on Earth is given the option either to move to the asteroid belt on some kind of rotating space colony and have as much stuff as they want. They can have energy. They can have, you know, I don't know, uh, like veggie burgers, whatever. Like you, you know, you have all that all the stuff that we have on, on the asteroid belt. Or she says uh, you could have Earth and nothing. I mean, just no technology, no power, no, and at that point, she says, the people who stayed, all of the rabbis and the lamas and the teachers came forward to remind people how actually to live on the earth and how to sustain themselves, and, you know, the folks who wanted to be more comfortable moved to the asteroid belt. So I asked my students, all right, where do you go? Right. Do you, what do you want? Do you want the asteroid belt on like a rotating shopping mall, but with like everything you have? Um, or do you want the earth and nothing? And with the exception of one student, they were all like, shit, I got to move to the asteroid belt. And they didn't feel good about it, right? They weren't like, yes, Elon, they're not that kind of, my students at least are not that kind of, they're not, and they hate Jeff, but they're just like, I, I can't. So, and it was at that point that I was like, it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. How is it easier to imagine living without air than without your phone? Like, how is that possible? But I see it. I see it. I'm not making fun of this logic. I understand what they mean. They're like, you could never convince people to give up their stuff. So you're going to have to take them off the earth. So I think that that's, <laughs> there, yeah, there's a convincing, that the logic is convincing, I think, in a lot of ways that the, the messiahs themselves are not. Um, Counter-narratives. Okay. Um, so, right, this branch of feminist, Afrofuturist, indigenous futurist, there's a great indigenous future vo futurist volume by Grace Dillon that um, sort of coins the genre of indigenous futurism. It's 2012. It's called Walking the Clouds. Um, and uh, indigenous futurism uh, is an explicit um, conversation with Afrofuturism and uh, there, there, you know, gives ways of 
deploying traditional ecological knowledges, um, particularly from Native American and Native Australian, Aboriginal Australian communities, um, to imagine different ways of being in the future. And the thing is, like we, so, so the human community has already done this, right? The human community all over the place has ways of living on the earth as the earth without destroying the earth, right? Um, it just, it's just not this one, <laughs> like not this particular one that I grew up in. That, right? um, so um, certainly indigenous and Afrofuturist literatures, I think, are hugely helpful here. Um, but also like Pope Francis has an, a, like a different kind of story about how we're supposed to live in relation to the earth and calling all of the creatures around us brother and sister and caring for them and abolishing capitalism in order to care for the poor and this intertwining of um, you know, the, the disaster of poverty and the disaster of warfare and the disaster of ecocide. Um, so you, you, the, I think that these teachers are all around us, um, even in, you know, even at the head of the, the, the Christian body that colonized the whole earth. Like at this point, he's like, yeah, this isn't a good way of living. Um, so they're there. And I think the question is just how we, how we listen to them and how we, how we do things otherwise. But it's not like we don't have the imagination for it. I was wondering if you had any guidelines for distinguishing between um, genuine otherwises, uh -huh. genuine other ways of being, and the fantasies that sustain the ways that we live now. Because it strikes me that the people who go to the resort towns are wanting something other than the corporate world that they're living in. And so the imagination of this other world, mm -hmm. this resort town, is part of what sustains the system that mm -hmm. lets them continue to work. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of times really subtle ways that's still functioning, even within our attempt to imagine and otherwise we're sometimes sustaining what we already have. So are, are there guidelines for distinguishing between those two? Can they be distinguished? Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I think, I don't know that these are universal, these are not universal guidelines. These are my guidelines for the way that I, so things that I, I will call efforts to think of genuine otherwises versus um, efforts just to, to you know, continue as we are. And you're absolutely right that the, um, you know, resort culture of White Lotus, for example, is like a, a, an escape from the crazy rat race that sustains the rat race. This is Victor Turner. This is liminality. This is your two-day weekend in order to keep working as hard as you can on the five-day. So that's the same system. Um, the question is whether there's a different system. And the thing that I tend to be looking out for um, is uh, societies that care for its inhabitants. This, soci societies that care for its inhabitants. <laughs> it's just very straightforward, like all of them, like all of them, um, especially the ones who are poor, especially the ones who don't have access to, re like the, the people who have resources. I was, um, uh, I, how do I frame this? Um, I live in a town in Connecticut. It's a central Connecticut town that's like kind of, it's not on a rail line. It's kind of nowhere in particular. It was terribly planned. There's a highway along the river. Like it's a sad um, post-urban town that is trying so hard to bring itself out of the economic ruin of the 1970s when all the factories pulled out and all that, right? You know, you know the New England story, right? Um, and uh, there is, uh, there are a lot of different kinds of folks who live there. People of all sorts of different economic backgrounds, all sorts of mental health abilities and capacities. Um, and I, I was in a position of having to be in conversation with a police officer in the town who said, you know, there are a lot of crazy people here in Middletown because the problem is that whenever anybody's picked up anywhere between Hartford and New Haven, this we're talking about like a 50 mile radius, he's like, the cops always say to them, go to Middletown because you'll get taken care of there. Um, because there's a community health center where people can get free health care. There's food, there's a soup kitchen, there's an actively working, right? Um, and he was sort of disgusted by it. He's like, so therefore our town is a mess. And my first thought was like, holy crap, that's like the first thing I've heard in a really long time that sounds like a, a, like a gesture toward this kind of society. Like there's a place where you can go if you don't have a home and you can get health care. Like really, there's a town and I live in it and people make fun of this town because it's so weird and like badly planned. But um, so I think that's, that's the kind of thing that I'm looking for. I'm looking for a, a, a society whose inhabitants care for one another. Um, and, and this includes, of course, the, the more than human world. Um, Catherine, where is Catherine? Catherine has this beautiful, um, 
uh, uh, exegesis of another Le Guin story, Newton's Sleep in Destined for the Stars. Um, and I'm indebted to you forever for pointing out this amazing story of these, um, of this millenarian movement that uh, goes to live basically in an O'Neill cylinder. Um, and they, they take the, the best and brightest among them, and they take the, the ones who like passed all the tests, and they end up with an almost entirely white crew, um, almost, entirely able-bodied. All of the women have to be under 40 so that they're you know, decently fertile. And um, so there's this you know, eugenics project built into the... Um, and what happens is, well, I don't want to give it away, but they've left the rest of the created world behind, right? Like even Noah took one, two of every animal. Um, these imagine they, we, when we imagine these space colonies, we're not we don't even think about like taking two elephants with us and taking two giraffes and making sure that we have this kind of um, like biodiverse species. So, um, so th this this would also include a deep attention to the way that we're totally constituted by um, vegetables and animals and you know not just the not just ourselves. So, anyway, those are things I'm looking for. But it's not a good it's not a good heuristic. I understand that. It's just like this is what rings my bell. I'm looking for justice or something like that. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yes. This is maybe a little tricky. Tricky. Maybe a little sensitive. So we'll just see if it goes anywhere. That's okay. fine. Okay. But um, it's it's interesting to me. You're, you've honed in on some of the identities of these kind of billionaire um, space prophets, as mm -hmm. it, as it were. Um, mainly that they're they're rich white men, and it, it also occurs to me that Elon Musk is autistic, um, mm -hmm. and. A connection that I will draw is that Oliver Sacks, whom I'm sure you were, wrote, wrote a book called An Anthropologist on Mars. Mm -hmm. And that comment was literally in reference to an, um, a spouse, I believe, living in the, with the, in the context, context of a, an autistic spouse and mm -hmm. felt like an anthropologist on Mars mm -hmm. in relating to this person. And so maybe that's just a, an interesting coincidence, but I wonder if you care to speculate if or how or if it matters at all, how that might relate to some of Musk's visions and, and sort of relationships with Earth and, and space. Just a thought. Gosh, I wish I knew how to answer this question. I don't, but I, um, this, this produced, um, I'll, I can just tell a story, um, which is in, um, in my classroom, the first time I taught this, um, this particular question produced um, the, one of the hardest classroom situations I've ever been in. Um, because a, a student who was about to graduate to go work for Elon Musk and SpaceX um, got very upset um, about the students in the class who were criticizing Musk. Um, and he started um, t sort of tearing up and he said, you know, it's not fair of you to accuse him of being in the, all these privileged positions. After all, he's autistic and, you know, he, so he, he, is, he is disabled and, he's, um, and we need to be, you know, kinder to him and more understanding. Um, and, uh, and it took the students a while to recover. Um, and another of them said, yeah, but, but look at the damage that he's doing um, to all these sorts of beings and all these, and he, his SpaceX had just been um, audited for um, sexism and for abuses, like labor abuses and all that. Um, so I don't know how to, um, I certainly don't know how to connect um, his, uh, his, autism to his sort of seeing the world differently. Um, I think it's really cool to think about um, Greta Thunberg, the, um, the ecological activist who talks herself about, who gives an account herself and says, look, I, my autism allows me not to, forces me not to close myself off from the world and makes me open up to it such that like the des destruction of our earth is hurting me physically. Um, I would need to hear him talk about that to know how he experiences that. Um, but I certainly don't think, and I don't think this is where you were going, but I certainly don't think um, that it's a, that, um, that his having you know, neurodiversity is a, is a reason to um, sort of uh, allow him to escape critique or, or anything like that. Um, so, because there, there are all sorts of things you can do with neurodiversity. You can do good things or you can do bad things. And, um, and, but anyway, I would like, yeah, I don't, I haven't, I haven't, I don't know if you've heard of it, him sort of account for his kind of cosmic vision and his neurological situation, but have you, have you heard anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh -huh. He has self-perpetuated the the narrative that he is uh, has Asperger's, um, but there is no definitive diagnosis. And 
in the videos you see of him being very gregarious, very, he cultivates this after a period of time. And so there's a lot of debate as to how much of this is him performing this identity of the brilliant genius mm -hmm. uh, Asperger's and how much of it is actually real. Oh, thanks. So we actually have a question from online from Kadosh who is live streaming from Toronto. We live in the future now. That's amazing. Hi. Hello, Kagdas and Tio. Anyway, um, anyway he's, he's written in. He says, if you can ask, ask really quick for me, here it is. Is there a difference between Musk and those folks and all those data scientists that are now part of nerd theology? And aren't those people replaceable while nerd theology is not? Oh my gosh, can anybody in this room, or can, can we get more? I don't know what nerd theology is. Kagdas, Kagdas. I thought all theology was nerd theology. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I get into this line of work? Um, I am so sorry. Would you, my friend, please be in contact with me by email, and I'd love to talk more about this. Um, you can find me very easily. Just throw me an email and let's talk about it. Thank you so much for the question. I'm so sorry not to know. Um, what that what that is, but I want to know more. Thanks. Hi, Hi. thank you so much. Um, this is brilliant and um, thought provoking in so many ways. Um, and I get my question is, um, I, it hadn't occurred to me that um, where Musk has kind of multiple reasons for needing to leave Earth and contrast with Bezos, who condenses it down to one thing, yeah. and namely energy. Yeah. Um, out of all the multiple things that human beings need, um, do you have a sense for why, why he, uh, what, what's his logic? Maybe two questions. What is, what is the reason that he gives for narrowing it down to just the energy issue? Mm -hmm. And what sense do you maybe make of it? Like, yeah. do you have a sense for why he would narrow that down. Okay. Um, so let me ask the question behind it too, or answer the question that's behind it too, which is um, Musk never talks about dependence on energy, on fossil fuels, on um, polluting the skies. Um, he doesn't talk about ecology at all. Uh, ecological collapse is not one of his coming disasters. It's an asteroid or it's robots or it's like, so he just never addresses climate change. Bezos absolutely addresses climate change. Um, and he, but he wants to have a single, a single problem so that it, that one problem can be addressed. So it's not a multifarious problem because then that's going to, so he has to consolidate it into one problem. One could imagine his consolidating it into um, the relentless pursuit of profit, for example, which necessitates extractivism, which necessitates overproduction, which necessi right, um, necessitates inequality. And, um, now, he doesn't want to do that because that's precisely the system that he wants us to perpetuate. Um, so he, he goes for a problem that has, in his eyes, a very clear solution, which is the energy problem. He's also relying on the work of O'Neill, who's working in the 70s, who's responding to an energy crisis. And so for O'Neill, the energy crisis was the crisis. This was this, this sort of coalesced all of our other problems under the reliance on energy. So I, th I think these are some, some of the reasons he goes for that. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Um, I'd like to invite you to expand more on the note on which you closed the presentation, which is the word care and what you mean by care. Mm -hmm. If I can invite that word to travel, we began with the absence of care. We arrive at care. In the book, you name some figures who can keep the care, MLK, the Barrigans, Dorothy Day, mm -hmm. as opposed to others who don't keep the care. Some people have it, they had it yesterday, they have it today, they might have it in the future, but what is it? Great. Um, I'm trying to decide. There's always that moment where you're like, do I go for Heidegger or do I not go for Heidegger? Um, because going for Heidegger can be so helpful, but then you've got Heidegger and then you have to deal with him. And then you're like, why is Heidegger here? Um, but <laughs> there's, a sense, there's a sense from Heidegger um, with whom I have a very tortured relationship and whom I'm sure will make it up to all of us in the afterlife, his idiocy um, in the face of his extreme brilliance. Um, that for Heidegger, um, care is uh, dwelling with, that's how he defines it, a, a, a commitment to dwelling with, to remaining with. 
So what I make of uh, N.K. Jemison's community is this is a city in which the inhabitants, that, that, that what the care, which is marked for her by things like everybody can have a house if they want to. If they'd rather sleep outside, you don't put spikes on benches so that they can't sleep. You make sure that the bridges are swept so that people, if they want to sleep there, can sleep there, right? Um, everybody has money. Everybody has enough food. Everybody, like, these are the sort of markers of care. Um, but it seems to me that you only get to those markers if you are committed to living with, like living together, not living in a different place, not living in a wealthier enclave, not living with a... Um, so I would, I would, I would say <laughs> That, um, and again, this is like this is like my 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 little caredar um, starts beeping when I see um, practices that um, are put into place when people are committed to dwelling with one another, living with one another, and treating one another um, as though everybody is just as important as anybody else. Is that do? You, Thanks. We're going to take one final question from over here. Okay. Um, oh, thank hi. You. Hi. Thank you for your brilliant and horrifying presentation, and especially for uh, helping the pill go down easier with your great sense of humor. Um, it seems to me that most religions have to do with a promise of divine rescue from this world. This one has a new twist, uh, especially with Musk, that we're going to somehow go off to some other galaxy. And these folks pretend to be really science-y, right? But uh, what we know is that the universe is expanding. And I've never heard a credible scientist suggest that anything like these folks are suggesting is anything but fanciful. Um, do they ever get pushed and, um, by uh, scientists who say, you're, you're literally not on planet Earth intellectually on this stuff? And here's the problem with Obama. And oh, and first of all, let me, let me go back to the um, religion and otherworldliness. And I am totally indebted to your work on green religions and earthly religions. And um, Jay-Z Smith has this distinction between what he calls utopian religions and locative religions. That utopian religions tell us that our real home is somewhere else. And locative religions say, this is where we come from. This is where our ancestors are. This is, and these are, of course, the traditions that you're interested in. Right. Um, so this, in my, in my um, informal catalog is, a, is, is an extreme and, again, a sort of plotting version of a utopian religion, just in this very sort of concrete, bad, white, heady form. Um, okay, uh, now I've lost track of the, other, of, the, of the big question. The big question was about, remind me, oh, the scientists, science, yes, what does science say? Okay, so here's the thing, this is what scientists say. Scientists say, this guy is nuts. This man is, is absolutely off his rocker. We can't nuke Mars, we can't... But I'm not gonna get, I, 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 a geologist, I'm a planetary scientist, I love Mars. And I wanna know about rocks on Mars. And I wanna understand what they are and where they came from and what it says about, is there like some little biota hiding in a rock somewhere on Mars? That means I need missions to Mars. And NASA isn't funding those freaking missions. And I know, if I'm a planetary scientist, because this is what my planetary scientist friends say, that if they ever get to Mars, it's going to be on one of Elon Musk's rockets. Right? If they even just get like a, a robotic lander on Mars. Right? So increasingly, science, our scientists, are epistemologically dependent upon the corporate sector of the space race. And as one of my friends said, she was like, I hate this guy, but if he can get me to Mars, OK. Like, how else? Am I? NASA hasn't done it. Like, what have they been doing for the So this is the problem. It doesn't matter that he's intellectually debunked. He's getting the stuff in the sky, right? And then, and then this is the same issue. And then it, depending on your political orientation, um, it, whether you care about the moon or Mars, you might debunk him scientifically. But you're like, yeah, but we got to get to the moon because China. And that's all it ever is. There's, there's no indication of like what. It, it's just because China. Um, and so therefore, no matter what, you, you know, we can, we can dismiss his long-term visions, but like he's, he's going to make a lander that lands on the moon, and he's going to help us make the gateway that allows us to rotate anywhere we want on the moon, to navigate anywhere, anywhere we want on the moon. We were not going to be able to get a decent military position without this kind of reusable, affordable space technology. He's the one who's giving it to us. Who cares that he's a crazy person? We need, we need him.
Yeah. And on that note, <laughs> please join me once more in thanking Mary Jane. <laughs> <laughs>